grave of the world But a voice in the wilderness Can never be heard Now we will end the good things Now we all 
Kani, do you want more? The last night of the British Tour, ladies and gents, you can do better than that, I'm sure. What about the foot stamping? Demon! Demon! Ladies and gents, back on stage for the last time, live at Tiffany's Demon.
Once again, we were observing and, and thinking that it seems to be everything in life is, is governed by a circle. You know, whether it be you know the tire, the wheel, the circle of friends. Um, you know, the way that, that sort of uh, towns and things are built. Everything came down to being a circle. That was our original um, observation, shall I say, keeping in um, in line with the album being an observation. We couldn't do a set without certain tracks. I mean, you would have to do Don't Break the Circle. I always joke on stage, you know, that was our big hit. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a demon anthem and uh, you've got to play it. Take your place in the circle. I think, well, I'm, yeah, I think Don't Break the Circle would be in there. I mean, I do like the spell. It was um, just something about the something about that track. We would tend to put a particular lyric, not necessarily to what you would think would be that melody. Um, and looking back, I realised that on a lot of things, you know, something... I mean, the spell is quite melodic, dealing with these guys sitting in France supposedly calling up the devil, oh. um, which later bands would have done it far more grungy, um, detuned and uh, sang it in a devil voice, which someone did. They did we did a tribute to... Uh, to Demon and they did the spell in that way which is which really it made me realize that it's um, it, I thought it was a good version and that's why I realized it could have been done at a later stage mm. and what we've done is, is very much as we spoke before with harmonies traditional harmonies we would go down the road of a fairly heavy lyric with a melodic song which in itself I don't think most people would do
And we did the unexpected guest, and, and when I've been in Demon, there's so many things that have happened. Um, that I, I do I do have a, a belief for something else. I'm almost certain there is, because having spent the years in Demon, uh, I couldn't be convinced otherwise. There's been so many things and so many sort of happenings. And, and have I been here before, going back to that, I remember doing it and thinking, um, you know, at that period when these sort of things started happening. And I thought, yeah, I mean, which led us to write that type of thing also, not just an observation, but we were observing what was happening to us, yeah. which was a lot of... Uh, we used to joke about it, and then we said, well, you know, it, it never frightened us or bothered, but so many things happened that you say, well, no, no, that can't be just... Um, and take a name like Demon and all these things, you know, that they are unbelievable so but have we been here before is i do like that track but once again i mean it's quite a deep lyric on quite a jolly type of track mm. you know it's it, looking back we, we did strange things like that and didn't particularly do it consciously but if i was critical and, and in the nicest way i'd say well you know have we been i believe after life the spirit lives on i mean you could well imagine it being a a sort of bogged down grungy heart, really, you know, really sort of calling the devils. And we were singing it almost in a light hearted rock pop. But, you know, that's, I mean, that's just the way we were. And I think it's great also because if he'd have stopped and somebody had pointed it out, he would have changed it. But it was because we were called Demon, it was this, it was that. We couldn't change the style of melodic writing that we did. We could lyrically try to make it fit him and Demon. I think that's why you get a lot of big, big melodies with, with some heavy lyric, um, you know, like spell, like uh, Have I Been Here Before, you know, that was probably one of the um, first songs that I got involved in, which later became a trend of Demon, of, of, you know, catching what was going on in life, you know, just sort of catching a moment like Remembrance Day and sort of, you know, that became a later style of Demon. Yeah. I think that was the start on that album was maybe a start of that sort of uh, thing. a lot of tracks on that album. I mean, one that's always close to my heart is um, Strange Institution, which I wrote about my father, who was, who was only 59 when he died. He was a, he was a miner, um, took early retirement, never drank, never smoked, fit as a fiddle. Um, uh, you know, and he, and he sort of, uh, he, he became a different person because he'd, he'd obviously got things like Parkinson's and things like that. And, and it was, um, it was a total strange institution. I didn't know where he was, you know, he was in a different place. Mm. Uh, he stares alone in the night and, and lines like that. And Chris mentioned the haunting sort of face things. Um, you know, that, that, that came about because of something that was happening to me, which is, um, you know, still quite a haunting song when I hear it. And we do get quite a lot of requests abroad when people say you're going to play a strange institution. Everything happened on the unexpected guest here. And I think in all there was 20 dates that we ever did the unexpected to, which I would call the soup the head. 18 of the 20 dates definitely strange things happened. Marquee, for instance, um, we we played the marquee, and I used to. Um, <clears throat> we had a drum riser, and at the front of the drum riser it came a little bit further, about six foot out and it was cut out at the front so virtually like in the shape of, of a grave with the two crosses at the side and I would get underneath on stage, climb underneath yeah. earlier in the day I would have gone out and got leaves from around London or wherever and dried them out sometimes if it was rainy and then yeah. I'd put newspaper over the top of the grave and then put the leaves on top so basically when I climbed in the lay down and I would make them move as we've mentioned earlier and then I'd punch them and the leaves would float in the air. When we did the marquee, 
which is probably um, the hottest I ever remember a gig in my life. There was actually people passing out because they had the St. John's Hamilton that that it was that warm, and I was in this latex suit. So the lights went down, and, and I came out on stage, and I would get under the back of, of, of the drum riser, and in I'd go, and then I'd lie there, and they start rise, 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 and then I burst out. The first night in London of the band ever, they put the the drum riser right up to the wall. So I looked down and said, I can't get in. And they're going, rise. And the crowd are going, yeah, right. And they're sweating. And I said, I can't get in. So they stopped it. So then I go back in the chain room, nobody sees me in the audience. So they had to then push the drum riser forward. Back I came again, I got in, burst out, show started. Within about um, a couple of minutes, someone shouts, Mal's down. <laughs> Almost like, Miles down, as it you know, we're in Vietnam or something. And what had happened, he, he slid down the back wall. And he, what we found out later, he got food poisoning, he was rushed to hospital, slid down the back wall and collapsed at the back of the stage. Um, and they took him off. We carried on playing without him. First night in London, all this publicity about Demon. That is the marquee. There's loads of photos there of the marquee, this particular night. And when I eventually took the suit off, that sheer heat captured on me. There's no smoke because all the other photographs, they don't allow smoke. If you notice there in the marquee, no smoke. That's the marquee again, no smoke. So virtually that is an amazing photo. I always think that um, the unexpected guest did appear here where you see the two eyes and um, me sweating. That's the third number in, ripping the suit off. And you've got to imagine there was no smoke allowed at the marquee in every other photo, so perhaps old Nick had appeared with us there on stage. But, I mean, that was, uh, that was something I didn't look at until many years later, but that was the marquee. We played Leek on the tour. I was in a graveyard at midnight. Um, we were actually rehearsing in Leek, and we were doing the tour, and I think we had a day off from the rehearsal, set the gear up at Leek Football Ground, where we were to do the open air. And... Um, Leak Post, the paper asked if I'd pop back later on. And I happened to be doing a, a gig with Mal. We did clubs and pubs and we happened to be in the area. And I said to the girl, well, we'll come back. And she said, well, can you go to the local disused graveyard now? And this is quite true. We got back and it was almost 12 o'clock from this gig. And the moon was out, full moon. Unknown to me, I'd been set up. Because if I'd have known, I wouldn't have been there. But I put the, de I put the suit on. This was a, like an advert for the Leak Post. They were going to photograph me. I got the suit on. I'm standing there in the bushes. This girl's photographing me at midnight. All of a sudden, uh, 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 uh. police come round the corner. Uh, I, I run off in the <laughs> run off in the bushes. I mean, the, the rest now. I've been, I've been to places in Europe where they've said, "Tell us about when you were arrested for devil worshipping in the graveyard. How long did you spend in jail?" And it's been it's Robbie Nord. It's been added to and added to. And we actually had, uh, a few days later, the news of the world came up. And that blaspheming, everything it said, you know, vi vicars were, were complaining and the clergy were... If we'd only known, I mean, we could have exploited, but basically I'd been set up by a guy named John Toolan. And uh, he thought, what a great story, and it had been planned. And I had no idea, of course. And um, it made the papers, it made the... Sunday papers came down and photographed me at the graveyard, I still got the photos, and... Um, I mean, that was another one, that was leak, but I mean, that's folklore the world over now. I mean, everything's been added to it about sacrificing virgins that day. And uh, I mean, basically, I ran off because the police came and uh, <laughs> scarpered. <laughs> well, you know, it was added to. And uh, in, fact, the, in fact, the guy who saw me was a, a, a sergeant who lives three doors down from me. <laughs> he actually shouted my name. How he knew me with all the gear on, like at midnight. We played the Granary in uh, Bristol. And um, I couldn't remember any particular incident about that until some months ago. Um, a guy who was a roadie, there was Wilf was the roadie, he did the, uh, the desk. And he had a partner with him uh, called Steve, who, who later went into the police force and now retired. And I met the Steve one day and I said, uh, you know, I'm just putting together, you know, things, because they did every night on the two, things that may have happened. And, uh, and he sort of said, don't you remember the granary? And I said, no, nothing particularly happened. I remember the place. It was an old granary in Bristol, you know, winch the gear up and all that. 
He says, no, don't you remember when you were coming back? <laughs> and then it dawned on me, what had happened? He got this big van, and apparently they were driving up, heading towards the motorway and totally missed the roundabout and gone over it. <laughs> and we drove up behind and this bloody van sticking in the middle of the roundabout where the flowers and everything were. And they were getting the gear out the back. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I don't know. He said, we, you know, we fended up on the roundabout. And they weren't badly injured, but I'm, I, you know, I, I'm trying to think if anything happened at the granary, but you know, he said, oh, we could have been killed. I said, why did this happen? He said, I don't know. He said, we just didn't negotiate this roundabout straight up. I think one of the craziest moments ever in the history of Demon has and, 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 is, is got to be working. Well, you've got to realise, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you about things that were happening every day. You know, there wasn't a day that, that, that it didn't happen. It did, and we went to Workington. And, and it was quite sort of... Um, it's the Carnegie Theatre, and it's a perfect theatre with its pet, orchestra pit and everything. And um, I've told this tale so many times, but it still fascinates me. The act would start, as I was explaining, and I would come up out the front of the drum rise, and they'd see me come up out at the bells of hell. And I would do the first three numbers with the head on and the suit. And then I would go off, rip these things on, and, and, and become, you know, the madman-like. And as I went down to the changing room, um, I, I hadn't noticed earlier when there was no one in, we were just changing. I was actually by the orchestra pit. And I was just getting changed, and the band were continuing to play. And then I, I put my head forward and looked up, and all these guys, they were there, they couldn't see me. There was about a 10 foot gap where the orchestra would be, and they couldn't see me. And I could see them, and just to spare them, I thought, right, this, this is my opportunity here. So they're looking at the stage, they've seen me go off, and, and they're quite incensed by them. They were really a wild crowd. They were sort of, uh, I don't know what they were on up there like, you know, but. Uh, so. Just before I was due to come on, I, I climbed up because there happened to be some steps and I was about a foot from all these people. So I thought, right, I'm going to have this. And what I did then, I pulled myself up and I shot up in front of him. Now you've got to imagine, this guy with all blood and black eyes and a skull cap jumps up in front of him about six inches away from these people. And there's this huge, he let out this huge... <gasps> anyway, I eventually get back on stage and for the rest of the evening, I mean, they, they, were, they were absolutely like children of the damned out there. Their eyes had gone. They were under the spell. But the funny thing is, when, when we finished the act, they started coming on stage, these people. They were almost like being led. And so at the end of the act, I normally got back in the front of the riser, crawled out to the back of the stage, and I was gone. <laughs> but this particular night, I got in, and then one followed me. And another followed me, and half the audience climbed into this thing. And I thought, I got out at the back, and I thought, where do they think they're going? The bowels of hell. And I, it was astounding, you know. There was one, two. They all kept falling. They all coming out the back of the drum. I remember Crowy, the drummer, turning round and saying, "What the?" <laughs> at Birkenhead, uh, this person, I, I was summoned to the door in the afternoon. They said the particular person wanted to see me, and it was said that she was either some sort of witch or a white witch. And I, and I went and she looked sort of you know, gothic and everything and she held me hand and said, how are you? And How's my wife by name? How's my children by name? And I thought, well, I've never, you know, I don't know yet. She knew me. She was very, very familiar. I, not to me, but I, you know, the feeling was, she was speaking to me like uh, she'd known me for years. and. Um, she gave me, they, they used to give me these little crosses and she gave me something and uh, sort of blessed me. But the thing that bothered me forever, I remember, she knew the name of my three children, the name of my wife. And uh, to this day, I've never seen her again. But I also remember that night, is, <laughs> which is a quite funny one on that, is uh, I got in the grave, Rise, Rise came, and I, I come to get out of the grave. And I always used to notice the band were on stage then, and I could see the guitar player, Mal and, and Les to the left and Chris to the right. <laughs> and I came out of the grave that night and all I could see on the right was like somebody being catapulted from the back of the stage straight into the audience. And what had happened, Chris had stepped on stage, it was wet. And I'm going to rise like, as he shoots past me like on a toboggan, <laughs> straight into the audience. And I remember three or four people pulling him back on stage. And, uh, you know, so that was Burke and Ed. But I also remember we played in Middlesbrough and, um, it, it was, you know, it was like boarding on your Geordie land and that, and 
they'd been reading the press about demon suits and all that. And I remember that they were they were like wild animals. This audience, they, they were they were throwing and everything. I got out the grave and it, you know, they were really giving each other. And they started throwing. And I got out this grave and thought, we're going, well, we're going to have one here. But we got them by the end of the evening. Um, you know, basically we, we we worked at and they could see we were a rock band that could play. And we ended up doing an encore, but it was one of the hardest I remember because suddenly if the last place on earth you want to be is in a latex suit with horns when there's 200 jobs baying, <laughs> 200 jobs baying at you and throwing cider bottles and everything. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. You know, you don't want to be there. So, you know, we, we, we did work. <laughs> we did work at it and it worked, but. Uh, oh, I'm stuck with that. <laughs> <laughs> the last place you want to be is a late suit with Yeah, in, in Middlesbrough on a Friday night in a depressed uh, yeah. area. But also, the one I remember... You wouldn't do that for a bet, would you? We played at Porterhouse Ratford, which was on the circuit. And um, very, very, you know, on the room in... Well, you can't see on here, but a small room. And Porterhouse Ratford is like one of these uh, out-of-the-way places. Ratford is anyway. And when the pubs used to shut at half ten, everybody had aimed for wherever was was open. And this place was open. I don't think most of the people were into rock. It's just you could get a drink till two o'clock in the morning. And um, it was very, very close. The stage was small. And you didn't go on till late. And when I came out, it was one of those stages that the horns had touched the roof if I wasn't careful. So, you know, and I'm a very clumsy person, as Michael tell you. So I was getting out of it, and I was like, couldn't do all this. I was sort of all this and very close stage, the audience close and um, so I got out and started doing the bet and I went close to the to the audience as I did. Normally didn't quite get that close and I got the mic in my hand under the head and someone went yeah and caught the mic smack straight into me and knocked two teeth out at the bottom. Well it was authentic blood, it was perfect, you know, blood was oozing out of it, it was really my blood and the teeth were battered back at the bottom which I've got to play it there now. And I spent the whole evening sort of um, spitting blood and, uh, you know, I mean, it must have looked the real thing if anybody filmed it. But it was a very painful experience. One I was going to mention is, I think it's the Bay Horse, was it the Bay Horse? The one on the moors, Blackburn Way. But you, I'll tell you what it was like, you know, in, in the American Werewolf in London, where they're on the moor. It was like that, it was in the middle of nowhere. And I actually, that this is quite true, there was a lot of weird people around at that time that, you know, we, we didn't realise, and I mentioned this to you earlier. I was actually um, requested to come outside um, late in the afternoon, and there must have been a bunch of 12 people, and they were definitely from so, some sort of devilish religious type cult. You know, and they all looked a bit sort of weird. And they presented me with, the, you know, the upside down crosses, and, you know, this is for you and all this and it, it was I, I said to you, you know, it was like Crosby seeing some of them characters out of Deliverance and um, you know some of the nutters in, in the Exorcist nut house it, they, were, they, they were weird but it, it was um, I remember it was a good gig but I remember the experience talking to these people and I thought well for the first time I started thinking what have we got ourselves into here you know I mean we, it's when we played Cardiff we got it all set up in my ears, you know. I mean, it's not a big thing, this, but... And the guy says, you know, do you want to go and watch the film upstairs? And we went up and said to the woman, Shauna's in, what's the film? She said, The Exorcist. We actually did, I think it was about the 28th of December, we played Colwyn Bay Pier. Colwyn Bay Pier, oh, it was pretty... Uh, Colwyn Bay on the 28th of December and it's raining, it was pretty, you know... I mean, Colin Bay is great, but I mean, it was a pretty awful day. And uh, we got down there and we played on the pier. And, and this guy, after I remember, he says, Do you want a coffee? <laughs> That's a beggy part. He said, Do you want a coffee? And he did, and he, and he says, Come in this back room. <laughs> and we went in this back room, and this huge, it was ever such a big coffee. I mean, whoever had been in, it must have been about eight foot. And he says, I said, Where have you had this coffee from? He says, I don't quite know, he says, but it's been here a while. <laughs> he, says, he says, do you mind taking it, this coffee? So, funny enough, we, we, we actually took it the road, he's put it in. Put it in. He said, well, it might come in useful, you never know. <laughs> well, I mentioned Brimington Tavern earlier, which I think was Rotherham Way. And it, and it was just a place that was, um, if you had 200 people and it was rammed. And I got out the grave that night and... I was in the middle of people. It was like being in the middle of, uh, you know, solo. 
a grave came halfway down the room. And it was on an estate, it was absolutely a funny place. And it was packed to the rafters, but you know, only like 200 people. And I didn't know what to do, I got out of the grave, you know, and I'm looking around, I couldn't, couldn't see the group. It's like in somebody's front room. <laughs> people having a drink next to me. They were all going, you're all right, well, I'm in these old blood, you know. <laughs> there was a lighting guy called Johnny Prism, and he did the tour with us, John Prism, or Johnny. And um, he, he was a right character, I think he was Scouser, typical, and uh, we played the lad mill, so he said, right, I'm going to do you a maroon. And we said, what's one of that big explosion? Tonight, he says, we'll uh, something special. So we're on stage, you know, I'm in the suit and the head and everything. And all of a sudden, I tell you how I describe it, how people describe when they've been somewhere and the bomb's gone off. You don't hear anything first, you see this big flash. And I'm standing there on stage, and this flash, the lead mill's quite a big place. And I thought, bloody hell, is that this huge flash from one side or the other to, to, the, to the place. And, and then the old gear went off and went, and we just stood there, everybody was deaf and the audience were deaf. And we just stood there. And Lazar turned round. And he had blown his two before cabinets. Well he came to Lazar after and he said, Sorry about that, Laz. <laughs> we did Stafford and we did the Red Line and Warrington, which everybody did, and both places we had a power cut. Remember? Because mm -hmm. Malcolm Doe mentioned that yeah. in his review. And both nights, and they were on the tour, the power we blew. The power just bang, and the show was held up at Stafford for at least in, possibly an hour. And the same happened at Red Lion at, at Warrington, which which was a, a standard rock gig. It was upstairs. I remember coming out, and the whole thing just went. The whole place was in darkness. Yeah, the other one on the, on the tour that I remember was um, in Longton, which was a local um, place called Razamat House. I remember it on a Monday night, and the PA caught fire. I remember a DJ running over with a bucket of water. Trying to put a fire out it was on the right time. I don't know how a PA catches fire, you can imagine electrical thing. The PA caught fire. It isn't trying to remember when nothing, you know, when things happened. I mean, everything happened. It was trying to remember when nothing happened on some of these dates. The numerous times that vehicles did have, um, you know, punches. And, and the 666 did crop up, you know, on like 26,666 miles. You know, all, all those, those sorts of. They were just, everything was everyday occurrences. I mean, the only thing I'd said on, on, the, um, on the old tour that I couldn't remember is, funny enough, anything happening at Tiffany's, where the video is, the DVD. I can't, I have no recollection of, of no story to tell. Um, you know, no weirds, no, it was just a gig. Chris is probably the most naturally talented uh, musician that I've ever met. His late father was a classically trained um, a natural player, so is his mother. Chris has this wonderful talent, which he'll be the first to admit he's never taken any further, that if you were to play him um, Schubert's Fifth Symphony now for the next 20 minutes, he would play you back. So he's inherited this thing from his parents, but has never put it to... to to the use it could have been. Great keyboard player, could have been a really great keyboard player, but he sits down, he will, he will hear a song, and he will sit down, to D minor, E seventh, blah, 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 do the lot. Okay, I'm bored. That is Chris. Chris would play something for you the first time he heard it. The first time he played it would be absolutely spot on. The next time he played it wouldn't be quite so good. The time after, because he would be bored. And I think that's his maker, but, but it's a great talent. Crowy on drums, well, Crowy, I mean, I go back for, grew up with Crowy, he's a typical uh, local guy, um, got one of the worst record collections the world's ever seen. <laughs> In fact, he's got Charlie Drake's greatest hits, and he's the only person. <laughs> but that's Crowy, Crowy. tell some great stories. Um, if you went to Crowy, and I've done so many times, and you were dead optimistic, you got some wonderful news for him, and he'd laugh at this if this comes out. 
after five minutes on the phone, you'd be totally depressed, and you'd come off the phone and you'd say, oh, what have I done? You know, because he's where people are the eternal optimist, he, he'd be he's totally the pessimist. But wonderful guy, um, very dry, tells some great tales. Fabulous guy to have in a band. If you were in the trenches in a group, you'd want Crowe. And uh, it was sad the day he left, because obviously I think it was after breakout. We'd had a particularly bad gig, I won't say where it was, it was down south, it was an awful gig, and um, he just had enough, and, and I, I felt very sad, you know, because it's, um, we had a good period after that, where we went abroad and that, but he, he great contributor in the studio, very, very hard worker, um, wants to be involved with the product, uh, always 100%, great drummer, uh, when the cider bottles are thrown and you're there with your latex suit, you just don't... Johnny rides behind you, Crow, he's, you know, and, and he's your man, he's, uh, he's great. Moving on to Les, Les, oh, great natural player, beautiful player, I mean, Mal and Les, you know, they work so well together. I mean, Mal came from, from a sort of 60s, Hendrixy, Cream and everybody else, well, Les would come a little bit later, mid-70s, Purple, but it was perfect because it was slightly different, but they each admired each other because they could each do things that each other couldn't do, if you know what I mean. And it worked well, great. And, uh, you know, when, whenever we'd, we'd written a song together and then present it to the band, I mean, it, immediately Les, Les uh, you know, like Les and Mal sort of talking about the chords or, or, or the sort of arrangement. And he'd have it there and then. And, and it worked great, you know. So, well, superb player, uh, Les, who these days plays with Climax and uh, different people. But, Terrific musician. Obviously, we, we've been talking about Mal. I mean, he is in the shadows. I think Mal, that would probably sum Mal up. I mean, a very, very creative person, creative force, um, uh, June Smith. Um, tend, would tend to be happy blending into a background, but the input would be uh, phenomenal from, from a guy like that. Great guitar player. Um, quite a funny guy. I mean, I go back a long way. Um, in my teens, I first met Mal. I only ever knew Mal as a, he played lead guitar in every band he was ever in. And we mentioned uh, earlier about him in Demon being the rhythm player. It's a, <laughs> a bit of a funny statement because he great chord player, but he, he, I always remember him being a, a you know a lead guitar player. Um, I spent the years before Demon. We actually um, had written together and, and, and we had a deal with a with a publishing company in London because um, I for, would know him from. Um, been 16 and 17 in the days when people wrote songs and would take them down to London and knock on doors. And I used to catch the same train as Mal and, um, you know, because we wanted to be successful, we thought we were writers, thought we were performers. And then Ed, in those days, that's the way you did it. And um, we were great friends and then in, in the sort of pre-demon days we, we joined up, actually worked together, even though we compared notes for years and watched each other in bands and then we worked together and um, we did quite a few um, songs that were covered, nothing particularly huge, um, but we still shared the love of, he was playing a rock band and so was I and then um, eventually we, we, we sort of, um, I think went back to our roots, we wrote some songs and wanted to get a rock band together, so Demon came of it. I mean Mal played in a band called Fresh Air which was, I remember, I think uh, Mike, Mike Stone was telling me recently one of their singles is worth quite a lot of money. So I mean, he, he'd done the rounds like me, I played in bands like Iron Cross, he played in Fresh Air and we'd done everything, we knew each other, we compared notes, uh, we respected each other and eventually we worked together and then we formed Demon together. And Unfortunately, Martin Mal, had, 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 from a child, had, um, had, had had pneumonia, I think in those days, he'd left him with one of his lungs. He only worked, one of the lungs worked well and the other was always filling up one thing or another. So basically, we used to joke, I think, for all the years of knowing Mal had to take medication because of his condition. But he didn't think, you know, he just thought that's what he did and that's, in those days you didn't think people were not going to last the course, you just think, oh, he takes it. We joked about it because he actually had, a, a, in his later years, a machine called the Bennett's machine, and uh, which instead of taking the drugs that he had to take, he would put them in the machine, it's, it's the norm thing now, and it would blow it into his system. And, um, but it was quite new, and, and when Mal had it, and we joked that uh, 
the, the next tour we did would be the Bennett's tour and uh, you know he, he talked about his medicine and things in that way but I mean he, I suppose really he was, he was never a well man but you know when you're growing up or when you're mates and that you know you, until something happens you don't sort of you know you don't think about it you joke about it and um, I think I'd mal gone to live in Portugal in a, in a warm climate and not played rock and roll and eating food at four o'clock in the morning, a stale kebab and lived a normal life, he would have probably lived a lot longer but um, I think he was like me, he burned with ambition to write and, and to make a contribution. So basically, I mean that was Mal and, and right up until the, you know, the end of his life he was writing songs, we were writing songs together. He loved to play, he was a player, he came from that era, from that day where you didn't sit at home in your bedroom, I mean you got nowhere, I mean you could write songs and take them to London but if you're a musician you had to play and uh, you know that's all we knew and that's all he knew but um, <clears throat> because of his condition um, you know Demon was not the perfect sort of vehicle being on the road or you know late nights and sort of not particularly eating the right foods um, you know would add it to, to, to sort of Mal's demise as it were but uh, his contribution to the band it's just really unfortunate that we only did the four albums um, because we worked so well together. Um, but I mean, that's the way it was. I mean, his contribution was immense. Um, great player, great writer. Hell of a stickler for lyrics. He probably turned me into a lyricist. People might laugh because, you know, I, as, long, as, long, as well as the songs, I do the lyrics. But I mean, I'm the, I was the world's worst. I mean, I would sit down with Mal and do lyrics. And, uh, I mean, I could do things like the Screaming Night, Death on the Wind and the Heartbeat. That's, you know, that would reel out of me quite well and I'll say, well, where the hell did that come from? But when we had to get down to, to an album and, and really grafting them out, I mean, um, I would tend to look across the table and say, uh, um, what do you think, Mal? And he, 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 the one that used to get me with him, because he was such a perfectionist, he'd say, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get it right. But he, a perfectionist, I'd call Mal, great player, um, Suffered with Ill, Ill health but never complained and uh, contribution immense for, uh, for Demon. But that was just in the space, what I'm telling you now is in the space of five, six months in the history and the life of Dean. I prepared earlier. <laughs> Put the boy away for another day. There we are, eh? What a fine chappy he was. <laughs> <laughs> 